So let me start by introducing myself very, very quickly. Hello, everyone. I am Luciano. I am sure you can already guess that I am Italian from my accent. I currently work as a senior architect for a company called Fortierem, and I live in Dublin. I have been big into higher level languages before starting to do any Rust. Uh, I think JavaScript and Node.js are my favorite languages or tools to use for most of my daily job. And I've been the author of this book called Node.js Design Patterns. Uh, you can find me online. I'm very active on Twitter, but you can also um, connect with me either on my blog or on GitHub. Uh, very quickly, the company I work for called Fortierem is a business focus um, service company, especially focused on AWS and serverless. I left there a bunch of links if you're curious to find out more, but feel free to ask me later if you have any question. So let's get started. What is a JSON web token? So a JSON web token, it's a string that looks more or less like this. It's a little bit of gibberish if you're seeing this for the first time, but I'm going to try to actually explore a little bit more in detail how, what actually means what's inside a JSON web token. So you can see that there are two dots, which basically means that there are three parts in this string. And these three parts, you can identify them as header, which is basically the first part before the first dot. And it's interesting because you might have ever already realized that this looks like base 64, right? And it is actually is a variation of base 64. It's called base 64 URL, which is essentially base 64 slightly modified to be URL compatible. So the slashes have been removed and replaced with characters that you can safely put into a URL. So if you try to decode this first bit before the first dot, you will see that you will get a JSON and this JSON is going to look like this. Essentially, it's an object that contains keys and values and these keys and values are defining the specifics of this, this JSON web token. So the kind of algorithm that has been used for the signature and also we have this TYP that says this is a JWT type of token. Um, so nothing particularly interesting here. This is just a header where you can find some metadata about the specifics of this token. Then this is probably the most interesting bit. This is what is generally called the payload or the body. And this is the second part of a token. And again, this is encoded using base64 URL. And inside you will find an object encoded in JSON. Now, here you can generally put whatever you want. Here I just put a low Rust Dublin. But this is essentially the place where the kind of information that you want to transfer using this kind of to tokens will, will live. And the last bit of the token is what is called the signature. And it's just a cryptographic signature of uh, all the things that we discussed before. And essentially, this signature is what is going to give you the, the trust that actually that token is something you can rely on. You, you generally will have different ways to, to validate the key based on the type of algorithm that has been used to produce that, that signature. And the idea is that once you see a token, you can look at the signature and say, okay, this token is actually authentic. It hasn't been forged. So this is actually very important when you are using JWT. For the sake of this talk, it's not particularly important. So if you want to go into more depth, I, I advise you to, to look at this. But for now, I'm just going to kind of gloss over and pretend we don't even have a signature because it's not important for my specific application. So the point is, is that uh, these kind of tokens, JSON web tokens, are generally used to transfer claims, which it's a fancy way of saying there is a string that means something, for instance, an ID for an authentication session and you want to transfer that information across different systems, JWT is one way that you can do that. And security is generally one of the main application for JSON web tokens. So to me, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to see tokens around the web. And if you start to look into your cookies on Twitter, on all sorts of websites, you're probably going to start to notice that there is a lot of usage for JSON web tokens. So. I started to be more and more curious of, okay, let's see what actually companies and people put into this kind of JSON web tokens. 
And I started to find out that there is often a lot of interesting and even sensible information. So you can find emails, you can find uh, DNS, you can find uh, IP addresses, you can find all sorts of things that sometimes can even disclose some sensitive information about how the infrastructure behind that specific service is built. So from there, I started to have this idea of okay, every time I find a JSON web token, I can copy paste it to a website, like for instance, jwt.io, and I can see what's inside of it. But it would be much nicer if you just had like a command line utility that you can use. And yeah, you can maybe even write scripts and have interesting ways to actually explore the content of a JSON web token. And this is how the idea of building this tool called JWT Info came about. And it's written in Rust, of course, and you can just install it by running cargo install JWT info. So now I'm going to give you a super quick demo and I'm going to essentially show you how we can use this tool to look inside this specific token. Now, just a, a little bit of, of a spoiler, this token is coming from an example of OpenID Connect. And Open Idea Connect, if you don't know it, is essentially an extension of OAuth 2. And it's a protocol you, you can use, for instance, if you're building a website and you want to allow people to connect to your application using Facebook, GitHub, or other authentication providers. So it is interesting because you can already see that, OK, we are dealing with authentication. So probably in this token, I'm going to find something interesting about the current user. So now let me switch to my terminal. I'm just going to show you very quickly that if you just run JWT info, it's written using claps. So you will see all the kind of standard help, helpers around uh, documentation. So I, I can do JWT info help, and that is going to give me a nice help with all the parameters I can use. I can do version, and that will tell me the version. So this is all nice things that I got just by using clap. Now, the main way we can use this uh, uh, CLI application is just by copy pasting the token as the first argument. And if we do that, it's actually going to show us the, it's going to decode the token and show us the, the payload in plain JSON. Of course, this is not super nice to read. So you could do either a JQ if you have it installed, or you can just use um, another option called pretty which is going to format the, the JSON for you. Sorry, I, I have to remove this to actually prove that, that it's formatted. So the interesting bit is just, this is just to give you the example is that this is an identity token from OpenID Connect. So if you ever see this token somewhere in a log line or in your cookies or somewhere else, you should be aware that there is a lot of interesting information about that specific user that had that token generated for. For instance, you can find the email, you can find even a picture that's probably going to be coming from Facebook or whatever other provider was given the authentication. And one last thing that sometimes might be useful, there is another feature where if you just want to look at the header, which can be useful, for instance, to uh, verify uh, what kind of uh, uh, algorithm was used for the signature. For instance, here we used uh, RSA. Or sometimes you have other additional uh, arguments. For instance, this is a key ID, which in OpenID Connect, it means that the uh, authentic, um, authentication provider can use multiple keys. So this is actually the ID of the specific key that was used. So if you are a service trying to validate this token, you can probably use this key ID and then download the public key from the authentity provider and then use that to actually verify that this token is authentic. So that, that's basically it. It's a super simple tool. And to be honest with you, I, I wrote it also because trying to decode a JWT in Rust looked like a interesting exercise. I know there are a lot of libraries, but I actually ended up writing all of it from scratch. So it was actually interesting to play with the idea of decoding a string uh, managing all the different types of errors that you can have while decoding base64 or decoding JSON. So yeah, it was an interesting exercise. And the source code, of course, is available on GitHub. You can check it out and you will see all the crazy things that I wrote. 
And I was actually quite lucky because at some point I was following this uh, uh, podcast by Tim McNamara, who is the author of Rust in Action, very good book about Rust. And he was asking, okay, I want to find a new topic for my next podcast. Do you have any suggestion? And I took the opportunity to just sneakily say, oh, can you please review this crate that I just published? And I didn't even expect a response, but actually Tim was kind enough to say, oh yeah, that's an excellent idea. I'm going to do it. And you can actually find out on his YouTube channel, the review of this crate. And I also wrote an article about all the nice things that he suggested I should do to make the project a little bit more uh, idiomatic uh, as a Rust project. And I just want to share you with you two tips that I learned from that review. And there are more in the article if you're curious. One, for instance, is this nice tip. This is very beginners. Like I didn't know this one, but I suppose people that are already with few years of Rust behind the back, they will be very comfortable with this stuff. But essentially one of the main things that you will see in any Rust forum is like, why the hell do we have different types of strings? Why should I use str or string? And when I write a library, what do I do? Do I expose things receiving str or receiving string? And this was the interesting tip that I got from Tim that you can actually use this asref uh, generic trait to say, okay, accept anything that could be easily converted to a string that could give me as a ref that resolves to an str. And with that, you can easily use just an str or a string. So this was a nice tip that I learned through that review. And I took the, the opportunity to update all my code, which is actually available even as a library. So that was one more reason to uh, start to make it a little bit more Rust idiomatic, even though I don't recommend to decode JWT token with that library, because I suppose that the other ones on cargo are probably a little bit more battle tested. And there is another one, which is a little bit the opposite of the previous one, which is basically uh, if you can encode something as a string, but then it makes sense to convert that into something else, for instance, the main use case that I always seen for this parse syntax is when you have a, a, some sort of an integer uh, encoded in a, in a string and you want to convert it back to the actual integer. But I didn't know that you could actually use this as a trait, like you could implement your own trait to say, this specific string is actually a JSON web token. Since I have a, a, I'm writing a, a library that can parse those and give me a nice struct that allows me to read the different bits and pieces of the token, you can actually use the same trait and implement the parse method. And then if you say with the TurboFish operator, if you say, okay, I want to actually parse this as a JSON web token, you can do this nicely by starting from uh, this string and using the dot parse method. And this is actually very simple to implement because you just need to implement this trait. And this trait is very interesting because of course it keeps into account that you can actually fail in this conversion. So it's very flexible. It gives you the opportunity to specify the type of error that you might be triggering. And uh, yeah, and essentially this way you can make, if you are writing uh, libraries where you need to deserialize from strings, this can be a nice way to make your code a little bit more idiomatic. So that's basically it. That's all I have to share for today. I don't know if we have any time for questions, but thank you very much for, for listening. Thanks, Etienne.